Welcome back. Welcome in. This is Country Roads Confidential at Earsports.com, part of the podcast network. Chris Anderson, a week from today, college football game. I'll be in Pittsburgh at Akrasher Stadium. Probably going to leave shortly uh, now that I think of it, because that is a nightmare to get into that game sometimes, I remember. Been a while, but I'm pretty sure it's difficult. You'll be at home running all the important stuff online. Um, It seems like quite a long time ago that West Virginia scored as many points as Minnesota's right tackle in the guaranteed rate bowl. But here we are, ready to start a new chapter. Excited? Relieved? What's the right emotion for you? Um, excited. I think, it, you know, that that's always how the new season starts out. And when you can jump right into a game, it is something I always notice, um, in part because of the business that we're in. I think when West Virginia starts out with, say, a Towson or something similar, there's excitement, but it's different. When it's Pitt, when it's Tennessee, when it's Alabama, these teams that West Virginia has played in the non-conference to kick off a season, the the buildup, the lead-up is different. The uh, it, It's almost... And maybe it's different because instead of excitement, when you play one of these these lower level teams, you kind of quote, quote unquote know you're going to win. I mean, I know some teams have not always had that luxury, but West Virginia has. But when they play the bigger teams, the Pitts, the Maryland's, the you know again Alabama, Tennessee, there's also some anxiety I think that comes with it, some some concern, some nervousness about the team potentially starting the season off with loss. So there just seems to be a lot more going on uh, in the lead up to a a quote unquote real game to kick off the season. All right. Perfect transition into what we're going to talk about today. We're going to kind of get into the remaining unanswered questions for the Mountaineers. So about a week left. Um, Really, they'll they'll kind of have their last full tilt practice probably Monday if I have the schedule right in my head and then kind of, you know, taper down and get ready for the kickoff. So. Um, this week that I guess is concluding because they're going to have their mock game tonight. Um, really important when it comes to kind of making the bed, so to speak, before they leave town and go up to pit. And we, we've kind of already touched the quarterback situation. That's been addressed. So, yes, asked, answered, we think. Go back and listen to that one. But what remains, and I think what you have, a, you made a really good point. Like I said, you kind of teed me up here. Um, elsewhere on the 24-7 spy, site, preseason reviews for the big 12 teams and what do the the teams feel good about? What are they concerned about? And I did the contribution for us. I won't give away what they feel good about, but what I said they're probably concerned about was the schedule because they're the only big 12 team that plays two power fives Um, Thursday nights against Pitt and Virginia tech on the road. The tech game is a short week. You have a non-conference game to start a conference game a week later. Um, Boy, it's kind of a tricky September. And by the way, this is a team that that might need time to just figure out all the many changes and could be different and thereby better later in the season. But it's not going to get a chance to catch its breath and assess things in September. I think the big thing for me is, like, how do they prepare when they're going to need a lot of new people, whether they're transfers from other schools, other levels, or maybe even, you know, a handful of freshmen here and there, um, but can you get them a whole bunch of practice time when you're not playing an FCS team at the start? You can't put as much preparation in them, as many reps into them. So how many people are they going to have and trust? And then on top of that, how many options, backup plans, plans B and C, will they have or not have due to having to get ready for a tough September? And, and you kind of illuminated that point. They don't have the luxury of playing an FCS team. They really got to be 1-0. and Everybody does, but the challenge here is much different. I'm very intrigued by, you know, who who gets into the game plan, who gets some snaps, who gets on special teams, and and how much smaller that number is, and how much more restricted some of those players are, just because you're not working with the net, so to speak, of a presumed win against an FCS team. I do wonder, and we'll we'll probably talk about it once we get to the different specific positions that that are still ongoing would a decision or two be different if West Virginia were playing Long Island University in week one than if they were playing Pitt 
Um, cause I, I think there is a difference. I think there is some, I, I don't know. Do you go all out and just hope roll the dice with something or do you do with one of the new guys that don't have that experience, maybe that with, with this level, do you roll with one of the younger guys, but then you're concerned that maybe they're not ready. Cause I think, you know, even safety's coach Dante Wright kind of touched on, Hey, Jasir Cox is, you know, he's never played at the FBS level before, but he's played in a national championship game. It was the FCS national championship game, but it's still a national championship game. It is for a ring. It is for a trophy. It is on national television. There are a lot of people watching. So it, it came with the pressure. So maybe he's ready and maybe that kind of vaults him up to the front to be ready to play against Pitt. Maybe you don't have to rush him in if it's somebody else, like if it's LIU, maybe you give your young guys a shot. Um, I, I don't know, but um, there were some unanswered questions and I'm just giving more questions that we can't answer on top of those questions. Yeah, I think it's a great point. And a guy like, you know, Jacoby Spells, for example, he's going to play. He's going to play beyond four games this year. Um, they special teams for sure. But also, hey, is he going to be our dime back? Um, you might let him go for a spin against an FCS team. You might be a little bit worried against Pitt. So, listen, those are things we'll keep an eye on. I think those are really good questions there, too, to ask and, and not for us to answer, but maybe us to observe and then provide the written answer once we have them. Uh, visibly there but I think that's a really good point I think you might be more apt to maybe not name a starter or or anything like that based on who you play but certainly get guys on the field or in practice situations more but Brown gave a really good answer Um, they they try to apply as much pressure as they can maybe more so than usual to guys just to see how they react and then because it's going to be pressure in that first game road game Thursday night rivalry season opener uh, a good offseason a lot on the line so you don't really know until you get out there too I think without question, the number one personnel um, unresolved story here beyond quarterback is right tackle. No argument there, right? No. I, the only argument I'm gonna we're going to make here, and it's not that you don't already know this, but let's play semantics and say, is it just right tackle? You know, because I think everything kind of ties into the other positions. You know, if if the answer at right tackle is not currently right tackle, then it's right guard. And then all of a sudden, guys are moving. Yeah, guys are moving up and down the line. And then you got multiple changes. And and a couple of the things we're going to talk about here in a second, it might surprise some people. And they might say, hey, I haven't heard of that yet. Um, our VIP members have. And the coaches have been trying it. So this whole idea of, yeah, left to right is is already set all the way through left tackle to right guard and just trying to find out what's going on right tackle that's not true that is not true and i think it was extremely telling that neil brown put it the way he did during his press conference on monday um and he, what did he say he said we know of the seven linemen we're going to play right like that was kind of how he phrased it and he listed off the seven and and none of them were that surprising the set who the seven were that he named but I thought it was telling that he phrased it the way he did. Someone pressed him on this. Someone. Do you recognize who? Did you recognize the man? Is that me again? <laughs> mm. But Jordan White's involved. And let's just kind of work aloud here. Jordan White is a guard or center. Correct. Um, he could play left guard. He could play right guard. I highly doubt he's playing center. Unless Zach, Zach Frazier gets hurt, because and you can explain this, you just don't take your center out if you don't have to. Like you're not you're not giving him a rest during a game, um, and, and that 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 time and that continuity is just too valuable. You can't afford a bad snap or a wiggle or anything like that. So you want to have that guy in there. So that means he plays left guard or right guard. James Gamitter has missed time. Perhaps he's behind. Perhaps he's getting pushed by Jordan White. But if Jordan White plays right guard, you're not taking Doug Nestor off the field, <laughs> and Doug Nestor can play right tackle. Which makes me think this, Chris, and, and try to talk me off the ledge or try to talk me onto the pavement. I don't know. Are you are you going to juggle your line this much? Like, it's one thing to play Jordan White at left guard or right guard. It's one thing to play Jordan White at right guard, Doug Nestor at right tackle, just interchangeably in the game. Like, I'm assuming they're going to start Hubbard or Yates at right tackle in this scenario. I'm not sure where I'm at a week from now. But let's just say in the scenario that Okay, White's your number six offensive lineman. He's going to come in and play right guard. 
bump Nestor out. Like that seems very risky to me, which makes me think that perhaps my assumption is not right. And that the goal they're getting to, and who knows if or when they'll arrive there is Jordan white as a right guard, Doug Nestor as a right tackle permanently, not as a substitution idea. There is a man, a handsome, intelligent man who predicted this in August of 2021. I'd Some... like to think <laughs> I'd like to think that man was not wrong last year, but rather too far ahead of the curb, Mike. At least that's what I'm gonna tell everybody. You yeah, recognize I mean, him? I, I do recognize him. I, I do recognize him. I see him all the time. Um I, I went I just keep going back to those comments that they made last summer. And they would say repeatedly, repeatedly, and it had nothing to do with Milam, uh, you know, who, again, at the time was coming in as a true freshman. It was unclear. You know, everybody knew he was good, potentially great. But was he going to start on the offensive line as a true freshman? That was rare even for the best of players. And and more Parker Moore was over there, at right tackle, left tackle was a question mark. So I think everything they said was it was all the time. Jordan White's one of our five best linemen. Jordan White's one of our five best linemen. And all I kept thinking was, if he's one of your five best linemen, put him as one of the five linemen out there and figure it out later. And I do believe, I truly believe in my heart of hearts that Doug Nestor's broken hand last fall camp really kind of nixed all of that, that, that he was just not able to kind of play outside, that he was better suited to play inside with that cast on his hand then by that point they figured out that hey <laughs> this Milam guy is pretty darn good and he is ready to play so let's just stick with it and go from there and this time around you know Nestor's healthy they've been sampling around this fall camp push it around and I think that's where it eventually ends up does it end up there at game one I think for some snaps maybe even the first snap but I do believe that's the eventual answer for this West Virginia offensive line some depth positions on offense that are that are kind of intriguing. Um, sounds like Cortez Bram has made a move outside that he's they just realized that he's a guy who can get up the rail and run and, and catch the ball. Jeremiah Aaron, that hype has slowed down a little bit, but I think he'll play in the middle. But I don't think that's as big of a concern because one, he he might be the kind of a particular player where you got to do special things for him. Bubbles, um, touch passes, whatever. But I think they feel a lot better about the slot now because of Reese Smith, who evidently been terrific um running back chris what do we do about cj donaldson because <laughs> here's my here's my big unanswered question that i want to ask how do you get him in a game and and again not get discouraged if it doesn't work because it's going to be hard but also not get just smitten if it does work and then you lean too much into this this great idea that has a whole bunch of tentacles off of it that could be very productive but also may pull you away from the core of your offense and also presumably the strength of your running game, which is going to be Tony Mathis and perhaps don't forget uh, Justin Johnson, who has evidently been exceptional as well. What do you do with Donaldson? How do you get him in and how do you not stray too far um, based on his results? I don't know yet. I don't either. That seems to be the biggest, Hey, hey you want to talk about gamesmanship and being coy and everything like that? Maybe that's part of it. Um, I don't know if they're talking him up and maybe he's not going to play four snaps all all game uh, in the season opener against Pitt. Or maybe they are talking him up because he is great, but they're not revealing how he's going to be used. Uh, you and I have talked about, you know, him being in a split back set so that he can kind of um, float out, motion out, be a, become an inside receiver, a slot receiver, become a H back, become a tight end, whatever you want to call it. But motion all over the field and really give them options. But I thought it was interesting about the, or the the comments that were being made during the press conference yesterday not just neil brown or on monday not just neil brown but also um sean reagan when again someone pressed sean reagan on the cj donaldson thing and when when he last had him how long he had him and he made it clear like he barely if ever got to use him like I think he said less than a week, right? Was it maybe he said one week or less than a week? It was one of those two. Um, so can he truly kind of flex out and play tight end? I mean, I think he's talented enough, but if he hasn't been doing any work at all there for three weeks, 
that tells me he's like exclusively a running back. And if he's in running back, go I go to what Neil Brown said when he was, again, talking about the personnel and the guys that are going to play for West Virginia. And he, he got to running back, and he said Tony Mathis. And he said Justin Johnson, who, as you noted, had a big fall camp, had a, 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 apparently a very impressive scrimmage on Thursday, last Thursday. Um, so those are two guys to watch. And, and instead of going to Jalen Anderson, who has been – routinely referred to as the third running back. Hmm. They went to CJ Donaldson. But how often is that third running? How big of an impact is that third running back? Cause it seemed pretty clear. Hey, it's Mathis and Johnson. Oh yeah. And also Donaldson's pretty great. So I, I can't, maybe I'm reading too much into this. I, I, again, I don't know if they're playing coy. Maybe he's not being a factor at all. Maybe he's the secret weapon. I don't know, but I don't think it's going to be, tight end, flexed out, all this other stuff. I think it's just going to be as a, as a running back that maybe catches some passes. I don't feel like I'm going to get in trouble saying it because the offensive coordinator, the running back coach, have talked about this. I've written stories about this. They messed around with 20 personnel a lot in the summer, um, yeah. or excuse me, in the spring. And messed around with is isn't the right word because Harrell is so efficient that I don't think he wants to work on stuff in his initial install that he's not going to use. They lose Lynn J. Dixon, and what do they do? They move over a guy who can catch the ball, and, and run a little bit, and all of a sudden they're wowed by Donaldson. He's not their second running back. Right. Um, he could be on the field with another running back, which makes me think that there's a plan for him at 20 personnel, and he is perhaps uniquely positioned uh, to be a guy who motions out or motions into the backfield from the slot. It just depends. Like, I don't know yet, but, like, it, it's very intriguing to me, too. Um, I don't want to give away the game here, but you've heard some of these things, too, but I've heard some of these these things. The scrimmage reports on him are pretty wild. Um, guys don't like tackling him in a scrimmage, and he knows it and just runs at you and dares you if you're a safety to make a play on him because he's big from the hips down. And by the way, he's kind of fast and he can wiggle too. So they've, they've got something there to think, but how they use him, I don't know. And how did he end up there and make a move? If you go back and you listen to Sean Reagan from Monday and talking about the transition and how smart the kid is, he said he runs every play in the running back book, right, in the playbook, which is wild when you think about it because he hasn't been there that long. His ability to digest and retain the information and spit it back out to coaches blew them away. Um, he knows the playbook. He acquired it one day and had it down a couple days later. So he was serious about this, and when they realized that he wasn't going to get discouraged and he was going to attack it, and by the way, Freaky athleticism and combination of skills, they they knew they had something there, too. So onward and upward for him. You just got to take him out of the garage, and I don't know how or when they're going to do that. That's a really cool thing for me to think of. Uh, defensively, Chris, anything, anyone stand out to you? Uh, I thought the linebacker comments were interesting. Um, you know, he nothing really was said about – I mean, I, again, we're going to get to the secondary because I think that's the biggest question mark. Uh, defense going line by line here, defensive line. Yeah, said they're going to roll a lot of people out. We know that. We talked about it a couple podcasts ago uh, where I, I made a comment about, yeah, every defensive line coach wants 10, and, and then you listed 10 that could legitimately play. So <laughs> they might give it a try. Who knows? Um, the linebacker, uh, Brown said a very specific specific number. He said they're trying to figure out the fourth linebacker. Yeah. So – Give me, give me, give me names here, because again, my my first my first thought is, do we need to specify is is Bandit one of his three linebackers in this number? No, nah, right. Okay, that's okay, because if it's not, then it okay. makes a little more sense. If it is, then I'm like, wait a second, hold on, this does doesn't yep. make sense any longer. Yeah, Lance um, Dixon, who might be the MVP of the camp. Yeah, Lee Koba and Mike. Okay, two. Low Actually, is low. back. Low is back back. Okay. Uh, they, they stretched him out in that scrimmage Thursday to see what he had, and like he played a lot. They didn't need to see Dixon or get Dixon hurt, and they let Lowe go, and they were pretty happy with what they saw. Um, Tyreek Austin Cave has, has kind of made a case for playing time this year, but he's not blown away Caden Beiser. So what do you do there? And then do they have something um, now, later, and if so, later, how much later in Trey Lathan? Um, Cove is going to play the wealth of snaps, but in the event that he's got to come out or he gets hurt, whatever – who do you put in that very important middle spot? And I don't, I don't know if it's Jared Bartlett because I'm not sure that he's done a ton of stuff in the middle. I don't know if it's, you know, Lowe who probably knows what he's doing there. Could Dixon play middle? I'm not sure. But like the fact that they're looking for a fourth 
Well, that's a small number. So are they just looking for a guy who's the backup Mike or a guy who he fills in, but he's not going to go on the field. So perhaps they do move Dixon or Lowe over, for example, if Koba comes out. Um, and then all of a sudden you have an extra guy who can play if things get really crazy for you. I don't know. I'm curious about that one, too. So, yeah, the identity of the four linebackers, but also how are they getting to four? Is it a guy who's, you know, your third will? Um, is it a guy who's just a backup Mike? Do they move a will to Mike? I'm not sure. We'll see. And secondary, I mean, it, it just outside of Woods, just wide open. I yeah, mean, is, I that the, is that the sense you got there from the comments? Well, Floyd's definitely your cat. Yeah. Burks is definitely your free. Um, Burks is kind of really impressed. I mean, came back healthy, um, looks very different. And I think people can maybe talk about this better than I can. But, like, if you followed him longer, I think people wonder about his body and his size and all that stuff and how he would translate physically. He runs. He makes plays. He looks like a free safety out there now, too. So those are good surprises and, and good projects for them that they've come along as quickly and as emphatically as they have. I don't think there's an issue there. So I think you're looking at one corner and one spear right now. And then – I think similar to other spots, they know who it's going to be from a pool of players. They're not looking for guys right now. They're just trying to figure out which is the right starter because you can play the other guy, but it doesn't work. But my, my hunch is that maybe Malinger starts and that Cox is just a super valuable guy who can play a bunch of different situations and perhaps play a lot. Um, he might be more valuable as a reserve because he can play a large number of snaps in different capacities. And then I think McAllister, excuse me, uh, Wes McCormick, uh, McCormick. McCormick. Why think McAllister? Uh, McCormick was the one in the scrimmage, I believe, but I believe Ajay played a bunch too. Um, I'm not bailing on my Rashad Ajay hype. I heard that back in early July and I don't think it's slowed down since thought it was telling that he's met with the media. Um, McCormick has it. Do you read anything into that? I don't know. Uh, but I think it's going to be one of those two guys there while this is a quote big week for Andrew Wilson lamp. I think that he'll get there, but he's just not there right now. Yeah, I'm with you on a lot of those things. I just wanted to take a second to uh, um, to maybe not hype up, but maybe hype up Aubrey Burks because he's a guy that I essentially mark down as not filler, but kind of just a placeholder uh, being like, oh, yeah, you know, they're bringing these other guys in and this guy will move here. Heck, they might even move one of these corners back here to safety because who knows what Burks will be and, and Hershey McLaurin. Oh, look at him. Look at his body. I mean, if you see him in person, and I think, you know, Dante Wright talked about it. Uh, they're just saying, I mean, you see him in person and like it, it's almost comparable to Bryce Ford Wheaton. Uh, I mean, there's very few guys that look like Bryce Ford Wheaton as far as their body, their physical stature, but Hershey McLaurin is, is nearing that. And so, I just kind of penciled him in. Yeah, eventually, you know, Hershey McLaurin will take over a starter. It'll take over a starter. And not to say that McLaurin did bad or, or you know, did poorly, uh, but Burks has done well. And, and I think every, even some of your reports from practices have talked about him being a standout during 11 on 11, you know, kind of live stuff. I don't know if it's, remember if it's 11 on 11 or 7 on 7 or whatever, but um, talked about, you know, him being a guy that's making a difference, a guy that's disruptive, a guy that causes havoc, you know, that havoc rate that we talk about a lot, that's important. And if he's doing that, he's a guy you want back there. And so I wanted to give him a little shout out here. Cause I've kind of written him off and like, yeah, yeah, he's not going to start. He's not going to start. And I finally switched that with uh, my projection earlier this week, because every single report from your reports, from talking to people um, about what's happening behind the scenes, He's just been great this fall camp. So that that's a very positive sign for West Virginia. Good instincts. Makes a lot of plays in the ball. Um, picks them off, deflects them, makes rapid tackles. That's great for a free safety when you got to get him near the line of scrimmage, which they're going to do a lot if they're playing um, man-to-man like this, and they're going to see four or five receivers sometimes too. Um, finally, I don't have any concerns or questions about the defensive line. We've laid out our case before. The fact that Asani Redwood's like a real guy, which is crazy when you think about it, but I don't think they can keep him off the field. Reports for him is that he's just been messing dudes up on the offensive line and they're going to get him in. Um, can he do that against Pitt? Don't know. Good offensive line. But he's earned it. And then Mike Lockhart, you know, I, I, I've i heard players really push him during practice to go harder, to to really try to, to not – I don't want to say give up because I hate that, that, that phrasing because I don't think you're giving up if you're playing. But, like, stay in the play longer and make stuff happen. And if you heard their defensive linemen talk about it, they run the ball. And that can be a hard thing for someone to pick up on if he's new to a spot. 
he had a good scrimmage and Brown said he's going to be a definite help. So now you're getting additional depth from maybe questionable or unexpected sources there. I don't think they're going to have an issue finding the numbers. Again, I wonder because of its pit in the offensive line, how many are going to actually play, which means how many are getting a ton of practice on to develop for not only the first game, but maybe the second and third game. We'll see. That's that kind of goes back to my initial question. But Chris. Bandit. Uh-huh. If you're so good on the defensive line and you've got two fast, rangy linebackers, and you love the speed and the length of your safeties, and everybody's kind of interchangeable, so to speak, right? Do you got to have that bandit? They've been really good getting, you know, through the middle, through the A and B gaps, pressure through the years because they haven't had great bandit pressure. They have to have a guy who screams around the edge. I mean, they're not going to not play him. They'll probably start. And, you know, I can't tell you how good Jared Bartlett's been or how good Linnell Carr has been just because I haven't seen it. Um Obviously, I've heard the customary promising reports, but not lately. But if you're so good in the defensive line and you love your personnel to be able to run, get to the ball, use their length and their speed and make plays, which means maybe compensate for whatever you might give up if you pull that bandit off the field and you're going to get pressure through spots that don't necessarily come from the bandit. How much do we see like a true even front or, you know, extra defensive backs on the field? My, my point being, can they get by, thrive, operate? Without a bandit. How often, when, where, and what's the outcome? Is this our annual move to a four two five conversation? Yeah, it seems like it's on time, right? <laughs> I mean, it makes sense, and we've seen them do it in spurts. And I agree with you. Again, this kind of falls into the same my same theory about the offensive line, where I was, hey, Jordan, if Jordan White's one of your five best linemen, put him on the line. Put him out there. Um, figure out the positions later, let it, let it work itself out. Uh, it's not quite that easy when you're putting together a defense, you know, you can't just put 10 defensive linemen out there, but I think there is some wiggle room with these guys interchangeable. As you noted, like some of these safeties look like linebackers. Some of these linebackers move like safeties. These defensive ends are, I I mean, you mentioned Redwood right off the top here. I think he's up to 280 some pounds but they're still talking about him having the speed that he had in high school when he was 250. Like if you have guys like that, if you can move guys around like that and you have that flexibility, I don't see why you don't dabble a little bit, uh, try some of those big, those defensive linemen at bandit or just stay screw it and go to a four, two, five and, and, and move from there. Just try to get your best players on the field. And punter. Were you, were you insulted when Neil Brown used that as a joke when he met it, with the media on Monday? It wasn't even aimed at me. It was aimed at Greg Hunter. <laughs> Greg runs the room. I just I just operate in there, I guess, quietly in the corner. Um, we'll see. The first guy out there, probably the first guy that they give a try to, I guess. I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if they have a thing where it's different guys in different spots if they rotate. But Colt McGee's been good. Oliver Straw's come along better. Straw offers more. You know, he's got a deeper bag of tricks. He can do some different things. But I think McGee has really impressed them by finally getting the chance to set Atlanta position and then go out there and compete and do it. And then, you know, we'll see who returns kickoffs and punts. Um, I think their kicker and their kickoff guy are probably settled. Long snapper settled. Holder? Settled. Probably Malashevich. But yeah. McGee is also held. Um, sometimes it's good for the punter to be back there because he's used to the snap. We'll see. Um, McGee's kind of an athletic kid, probably sneaky for a kick or two. We'll see. But listen, not a whole lot of unanswered questions there, but those are the big ones. Not a whole lot of time. Before the big one coming up a week from today, we will cover that all in detail in the days to come. Typical course of preview coverage for us, Chris. We'll unroll our plans for that before too long. But um, I see we get out of here before the buzzer. Until then, I'm Mike Casaza. And I'm Chris Anderson. Talk to you later.